many of you want to pray for being phlegm free? Huh? Oh, I tell you, as I speak tonight, it's going to get gruffer and gruffer, I imagine. So bear with me on that. There's treats waiting at the end. Tonight's title of the sermon is called, Wow, I Almost Slipped. Now this time of year you see the Minnesota Shuffle. How many of you have done the Minnesota Shuffle? Yes, isn't it? I mean, they, you know, you're like, oh, 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 wow, I almost slipped, right? Uh, you see it everywhere. You see it in the parking lots at Walmart and whatnot. It's kind of fun if you're sitting in a car, not on the ice, watching some people uh, do their dance. But I would imagine in other parts of the country, if they watched us on YouTube, they would wonder why we can't walk normally. But we know that we don't want to slip. How many of you ever said, wow, I almost slipped? And if I could have a buck for everyone that said that and how many times you said that, I'd be a very rich man, that's for sure. I was talking with a gentleman this morning and he said that uh, on Monday he fell and he slipped, not on ice, but he slipped on a dryer sheet on his laminated floor and landed on his knees and then he went forward and hit his head into the cabinet. And so it doesn't always have to be on ice, does it, when we fall? In fact, a lot of times that's the real shock, whereas we might be somewhere where it doesn't seem like we should fall at all, but then we find ourselves falling. I share that with you because we never know what might cause us to slip. And we're going to go to Psalm 73, and it's, it's a psalm written by Asaph. Now, Asaph was in the, uh, he was the choir leader. You could say he was the music director of one of the choirs in the temple. So he was quite godly. He was up there with God. You know, he uh, was leading them in the songs and whatnot. So he's not just some fly-by-night guy. He's not some guy that just kind of heard about God. He's been very active in worshiping God. And I share that with you because we come to realize that no matter how old we are with Christ, we can slip. We can slip. There's no doubt about it. We can find ourselves slipping. And so what I appreciate about Psalm 73 is because it speaks about a man who has that struggle. Now, how many of you, if you think in your lifetime, you could say, you know what, I think I've slipped from time to time in my walk with God. I think I've either backslidden or I've, I've been heading in the right direction. Things have been just clicking just right. And I think, man, I got this thing figured out. It's going so smooth. And lo and behold, you find yourself slipping away from where you want to be with God. It happens very quickly. It seems to happen sometimes before we even know what's going on. But I want to go through this psalm because you find a man that, that not only comes close to slipping, but he admits it. And I think for a lot of us, we never want to admit that we almost slipped, or that we slipped, or that we're slipping right now as we sit here. Because we might be judged, or someone might say, you know, the Bible says you shouldn't have trouble in that area. So if you're having trouble, well, then you just ain't got it all figured out. Or everyone else seems to have it made. I, I look out here and I see everyone that's perfect in Christ except for me. You ever feel that way? The people in the pews next to me, on the right or the left, they seem to have it figured out. They seem so calm. And here I am inside. I'm just this mess. I'm just this torment, this struggle, this storm going on inside of me in my life. And they seem to be so calm. Oh, they walk by and say, how are you doing? And of course I say, fine. Because if I say, oh my gosh, I'm just struggling, they might look down on me or say, what's wrong with you? You've got Jesus Christ. You should have no worries whatsoever. But that's a facade. That's not true. We need Jesus Christ because we slip. We slip. And so I want to encourage you, if you're sitting out here today, I know that every one of us sitting here has to love the Lord or you wouldn't come out here. I mean, it's sure not for this gruffly voice. And we have wonderful snacks downstairs, but I'm guessing you can find snacks at home. The Vikings are on and all this different stuff. It's cold outside. It's a little bit icy outside. It's been so much easier to stay home. So I truly believe everyone that sits here tonight wants to sit here because they want to participate in worship and receive something from God. Yet, I know that we all slip from time to time. And maybe we slip more than others. Maybe we're constantly slipping. But we want to show each other up. We want to encourage each other. And so Asaph, in his first verse, says this. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. I want to stop right there, and now we're going to go faster through the verses, but the point I want to make is, he, just like us, says God is good. How many of you think God is good? How many of you love his grace and his mercy and Jesus dying on the cross and saving us from our sins, and we can have everlasting life in heaven? Absolutely. Yet we find ourselves slipping. 
Now, there's a term called delayed gratification. You ever hear that one? Our grandson was at, uh, stayed overnight, both of them, but one of them, little Harvey, he's kind of incapacitated. He's, he can just sit there and wobble back and forth, so he doesn't get in too much trouble. But Oliver is four years old. Four-year-old's already got some minds put together. You know that? He's already kind of a manipulator. Saturday morning, we're going to have breakfast, and he gets up on a stool, and he says to Grandma, he says, I want a cinnamon roll and a piece of bacon because they're good for me, and then I want pumpkin pie. <laughs> and he got his pumpkin pie with whipped cream. See, we can feed him whatever and then send him on his merry way, right? As he ricochets around. But we come to find out that it's a struggle sometimes. We come to find out that, you know, we, we try different things and we have hurdles and all these different things and we struggle with that, but we find that little Oliver is already trying to put things together. So God is good, but again, we find that we slip. And so we go on to verse 2. Verse 2, he says, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. I want to encourage you on that one. He gives a confession. He says, God is so good, but as for me, I, I'm almost lost it. I know how God is. I know that he wants the best for me. I know that he wants to give me an abundant life, but for me, man, I almost fell. I almost fell. And I take comfort when I read that, because there's times when I feel like that. There's times when I feel like, I know God's so good, man. All I want to do is be in your word. All I want to do is walk in your path. All I want to do is be as sin-free as possible. And then I find myself almost slipping because of something in the world. Asaph is the same way that the head of the choir in the temple struggles. So it's not apparently about how much you come to church. It's not apparently how much you, you, you know, participate in different activities in the church. What really matters is how deep you are in your walk with Christ. How committed you are. Now, some people didn't come tonight because the Vikings are on. They're very dedicated to the Minnesota Vikings. They're getting excited because they might get to the Super Bowl. But some also went to church this morning because they knew they wouldn't be coming here tonight. But the point is, is we get committed about a lot of things. We get fired up about some things. We don't want to let it go. We're like bulldogs. We've got hobbies and different exciting things that we do, and we hang on to that so tight. Yet when it comes to Christ, sometimes we have to confess that sometimes we find ourselves falling away or slipping or not living up to that desire and that goal that we made. How many of you maybe this year said, this is the year that I'm going to walk strong with God from the day one, each and every day I'm going to pile into Him and I'm going to absorb Him so that I can walk a better life than I did last year. Yet life is still out there. Nobody told the world your goal. No one said, leave her alone. She's got a goal going on here. No one said, don't let her car break down. No one said, you know, don't make some bad mistake. Don't, don't talk evil to them. Don't cause struggles at their work because they got a goal to walk with Christ. And it's a walk. And when you walk, sometimes you can slip. So I appreciate that he's honest enough to say, I almost slipped. For I was, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. Now, I looked up slip. There's a lot of definitions for the word slip. Uh, you know, a lady slip can wear a slip and all these different things. We, we think we got to figure it out. But what I found is one that seemed to fit so well. It says to fall off from a standard or a level. To fall off from a standard or a level. And that's what I'm trying to get across to you is I know that most of us have a standard or a level that we want to walk with in Christ. And it's the Christ standard and level he has for us. And we strive to be those people. Don't give up on that, even if you slip. Don't give up on even if you stumble. We've got a God that's so full of grace, He just says, get back up, repent of that sin, and let's move forward again. He'll come and reach down and pick you up, even if you slip once or twice or whatever it might be. Just keep getting back up and coming to God and confess, man, Lord, I messed up again. He loves us enough. God loves us enough that He sent His Son to die on the cross. So if he's willing to send his son to die on that cross, I'm guessing he's willing to help you succeed in what Jesus died on the cross for, don't you think? Doesn't it make sense that if he took care of us so that we can have everlasting life, that he would take care of us each and every day? And if we fall or slip, he wants to pick us back up and move us forward. But he also looks at our heart. We've got to be honest with that. He looks at our heart and our intent. 
Are you slipping because you're choosing to? Are you slipping because you don't really want to follow my precepts? Are you slipping because you're caught up in things of temptation or the world? If you're slipping in those areas and you're choosing to, I can't do much for you. But when you decide to come back, when you decide to get off that weary road, when you decide to get off the dead end road that so many of us, me, me, me included, have walked down. We've shared it a hundred times here. How many of us have taken our own course? We got it all figured out. It's going to be fantastic until it crashes and burns. And then we have to start over. Satan doesn't want us to start over. Satan wants us to crash and burn and to stay crashed and to stay burned. And so we find out that that word slip, to fall off from a standard or a level, I want you to implant that in your mind because anytime we fall away from what Christ wants for us, we can say, you know what, I'm starting to slip. Lord, I confess it. Holy Spirit, catch me. See, that's the real trick in the maturity with Christ is to know when you start to fall away that you are aware of it, the Holy Spirit speaks it to you, you hear it, and you begin to change your behavior, begin to change your choices. Get away from some people. Draw near to other people. Whatever it might be that's going to help you so that you don't slip. Verse 3, he says, For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. All right, so he says God's good. He confesses that he almost fell. Now we know why. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So here he is trying to follow God, and he looks outside the temple through the windows, and he sees... People that are wicked, they're not anything to do with God, and they're succeeding and they're prospering. Sometimes as a Christian, we look out there and say, man, it almost looks easier to give up this life, and look at how they're prospering. I mean, gosh, they got all this stuff where they seem to have all the time. They don't have to go to church. I mean, church every Sunday, oh my gosh. And, and then giving and tithing, I mean, they take that and buy a boat. Oh. So sometimes we look out and we say, man, it looks like the world has a lot to offer. Those people that aren't walking with God sure don't seem to be unhappy about it. They don't seem to be turmoil. They don't seem to feel convicted at all. They don't seem to be struggling to do anything except enjoy themselves. And sometimes when we peek out there, we see those things. And so when he tells us what's going on, we realize that we're supposed to have it together, but we don't. Sometimes we slip. Maybe the same week, the same month. See, we don't all slip at the same time, gratefully. Someone might slip today, but they come into church and they, they have an accountable brother or sister and they say, you know what, I just got to tell you I'm struggling in this area. And they say, you know, let's pray for you, let's shore you up, we'll make a phone call, let's have lunch this week. We don't all slip at the same time. There are times when I've been really down. Sandy, unfortunately, has been really up. There's times when she's been really down and unfortunately I've been really up. It's when we're both really down that we can have troubles. We might be making some phone calls. But the point is, is that get yourself around someone that can help you. So verse 3, he's confessing that he's envious, he's jealous, he's coveting what the people have. And it seems to be the riches as we go on. Now, verses 4 through 16, let me read this to you. For there are no pangs in their death. Listen to the things that he sees about these people. There are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. Any, any of your eyes bulging right now with abundance? I'm just looking up there. Yeah, maybe after supper tonight. They have more than their heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, as people return here in water, uh, and waters of a full cup are drained by them, and they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly, who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue the generation of your children. When I thought how I understand this, it was too painful for me. You know, he must have spent a lot of time paying attention to people outside on the street. He seemed to have a lot of details down, didn't he? What's interesting is when we have jealousy or when we're kind of, uh, you know, wishing we had what somebody else has, we have it down to a science. We can tell you exactly what they have that you want. You seem to focus on it. It seems to grow a life of its own. 
When you're jealous and you want something, it just seems like that becomes the most important thing of anyone's life. I remember back in seventh grade when you might have liked a girl or a guy, and, and you're, you know, you're just you're looking at them and you're thinking, man, they're going to be so lucky to have me as their boyfriend. They just don't know it yet. And so you begin to make your move. You begin to write a note saying, I like you, do you like me? And, and all of a sudden you find that your best friend's already got them. They're going out. And you get jealous. And all of a sudden, that girl seems to be the, the only thing that you can think of. And oh, your stomach aches. And you play Crocodile Rock on the radio and you just cry your eyes out because that girl that I wanted so bad, is I can't have her anymore. It seems like some things that we can't have, we seem to want even more. And that's what it is with worldly things sometimes for a Christian. We know we have to say no to some things, but those things we have to say no to sometimes seem to grow a life of its own. It grows bigger and bigger, and we want to focus on those things. He definitely has been paying attention to what these people have. He wrote down some of these. I uh, wrote down some. He points out these areas of their life. Prosperity. Strength is firm. They're not troubled. They're not plagued with issues. They're prideful. The violence covers them. They eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than they need. They scoff at people in God. They enjoy oppressing others. They brag. They take more than their portion. They question God. They're always at ease. And they increase in their riches. Makes a case for all the things that was bothering him. I guess sometimes we have to stop and say, are we jealous of anything? Do we seem to covet anything that the world has out there? Do we see some people that maybe aren't in church, don't know God, but man, it just seems like whatever they touch turns to money. I know the man like that. It has nothing to do with God, but everything he touches turns to money. And I think, wow, if I could just have some of that, Lord, I want to serve you. And why can't I have some of what he has? It looks fun. But yet he doesn't know Christ. And so we find out, as Asaph finds out as he walks through this process, that, you know what, there's more to, there's more to the world than those sort of things. Anyone ever throw a pity party in your life? Oh man, somebody else got it better, someone's got it easier, and someone, you know, they just seem to have it all made in the shade. That's on the outside. But behind closed doors, you find out there's all kinds of struggles and worries and financial issues and Oh, you know, they're just spending, 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 let's say, to, to try to enjoy some kind of life. You see, our heart has a hole in it shaped just like Jesus, whether that's a cross to you or an image of a, his head or his face. The only thing that can fill that perfectly is Jesus. You know those toys that kids have where there's maybe a round peg and then there's a square one and a star and they've got to figure out which one to go in there and you can't put the, the round peg in the square hole. You've got to figure out which one goes where. We've figured out what goes there in that empty spot, and that's Jesus Christ. Other people have it, and they're filling it with all kinds of stuff. But if we're honest, sometimes we look at that, and we might have a little bit of jealousy. Beth Moore wrote this in a, a book called A Beautiful Mind. It's a teaching series out of 2009. She said, there's not a single soul that jealousy looks good on. Nobody. It looks ugly on everybody, and it makes us act ugly. It makes us act out of our character. Remember we were talking about when you slip and fall, you, you slip off of a standard? Now she's saying it makes you act out of your character. For Christians, we shouldn't be acting like that. Yet sometimes when we fall into jealousy or, or those sort of things or covetous or whatnot, we find ourselves acting like that. Not a good testimony for other people, but I'm more concerned with each and every one of us tonight. That we struggle with that and we find ourselves bound up in that stuff. Joyce Meyer, uh, in Overcoming Fear with Faith, she did a sermon in 2009 about covetousness. She said this, the gals are smart. Covetousness inflates the pleasure. Dwelling on the desire inflates its importance. It causes us to lose all perspective on what is real. Isn't that kind of true? If you're jealous of something or you're coveting something, that's what I was talking about. It, it grows a life of its own. It becomes the most important thing. You're just focused on that. Nothing else seems to matter, including your walk with God. Because we're after this thing. This thing is huge now. All we do, all I can think about is that. All I can think about is that. All I can think about is that. We lose focus. We lose what is real. We talked about delayed gratification with Oliver. Uh, you know, we took him to, to Dairy Queen on Friday. I don't know, we eat a lot when we're with him. 
He's, he's growing up to be just like his grandma and grandpa. So we went to Dairy Queen, and, and they said, well, you know, we have a Sunday with that meal. No, 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 do not bring that till later. Because if you set that on that plate, and you say, eat your chicken strips and your fries, and then you get that, guess what he's focused on? The Sunday. And he will, he will say, I'm, uh, he'll take one bite of a chicken strip and say, I'm full, to get to that Sunday. Oh, but you got to eat some fries. He'll eat one fry and say, okay, I'm full, I want my Sunday. The Sunday becomes the biggest thing of his life. He, he doesn't mind starving to get that Sunday. See, it takes on a life of its own. When we're into jealousy and covetousness, we're not into God. We're into that John 10.10 10, where Satan comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. And he takes that joy that we can have with Christ. He takes that walk and he causes us to slip. He causes us to try to stumble. Well, delayed gratification, Brian. You know, heaven's going to come. Just relax. You're going to get to heaven someday. But Jesus wants us to have heaven on earth today. If we walk with him and we live with him and we have that, that union with him each and every day, it's like having heaven on earth today. That abundant life again he talks about. We can have that today. You don't have to wait for 30 years. Maybe he's coming back in 30 years and so we trudge through just surviving life. Waiting for the 30-year day when he finally is going to come and we're going to receive heaven. He says, why don't you enjoy today and the next day and the next day. And sooner or later, it's going to be 30 years, but you're going to have lived a long life with Christ and enjoyed each and every day and been able to do good things for him. That's what he desires for us. That's what he desires. But Asaph is saying, you know what? I almost slip because I'm focused on what the world has to offer. What the world has to offer. Exodus 27 says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. That's a hee All right, hee ass. Anything that is thy neighbor's. He's pretty clear, doesn't he? He walks through a whole long list, and then at the very end he says, Anything that's your neighbor's. Don't covet those things. Because if we're so focused on those things, we can't be focused on His things. And so many times we're looking to the right or the left instead of looking up. And then life gets to be a struggle because we can't have all the things that they have. He got off track. He was almost off track, but what I appreciated, he's honest about it. He fell from that standard or that level. Why did the wealth of the wicked look so good to him? Why did it seem like they had it all figured out, that they were receiving the best things that could be? Again, it's probably jealousy or covetousness. I, I, uh, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I look at the rich pastors. I'm not talking about millionaire pastors. I'm talking about the ones that live around this area and they make 70, 80 grand a year and they've got a, a nice house, a stick-built house, not a double-wide, and they've got nice cars and, and they have you know a retirement plan and they have health insurance and everything else. And it's like, Lord, that would be so awesome. I could serve you, but I could have all that stuff too. But he says, just walk with me, and it's going to be fine. And so we live in a double life. We have older cars. We don't have health insurance. We're learning to fix our own teeth. No, it's not that bad yet. <laughs> We're going to start on Sandy's first. <laughs> you probably heard the story about a guy that called a dentist and said, how much does it cost to have a tooth pulled? 500 bucks. 500 bucks? I don't have that. Is there any way you can whittle it down? He said, well, you know, I guess we can have maybe one of the students that's here do it. And he got it down to 200 before he got it down to 100. Then he said, is it any cheaper whatsoever? And they said, well, if we give you no anesthetic whatsoever, and I would not recommend that, we can get it down to 50 bucks. 50 bucks. You do it for 50 bucks. Yeah, but no anesthetic. It will be painful. All right, I'd like to get a an appointment for my wife on Tuesday. <laughs> Isn't that how it is? Yeah. We can only afford one, honey. Matthew 6, 19 and 20 says, do not, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What Asaph is saying is, you know what? I started looking and saying, this is my treasure. Everything in the world can provide for me. But you know what? It's all going to fall away. The old saying, you ever see a, you know, a U-Haul behind a hearse? No. 
It's all going to fall away, and eventually someone will come to my house and have an auction, and they'll buy the junk that I thought I had to have, and then they'll think they have to have it, and so on and so on. It's Christian life dyslexia. We've got it backwards. It's all about Christ. We are rich in Christ. What the world has is fantastic if he wants to give that to you, but if you're walking with Christ first, he may choose to bless you with the exact same things that you've been looking out the window paying attention to, but he's going to look at your heart and say, am I first in your life? Am I first in your life? And that will make all the difference. But if he's first in your life, you're richer than any person that does not know Jesus Christ. And you can begin to receive the monetary gain of that today. You begin to have joy. You begin to have, you know, knowing that God that created everything has your back. That he wants the best for you. And he wants to meet with you each and every day. He wants to talk to you. So we went through verse 16, and he's like, man, all these people got stuff, but verse 17 is the big verse. He says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their end. Sometimes we just got to slap ourselves a little bit and say, whoa, whoa, wait, what am I thinking about? What, what am I doing? Remember the prodigal son who thought he had life all figured out and was, you know, finally eating with the pigs? It says, when I came to myself, when I got to my senses, when I, when I finally understood, when I had this moment where I could say, you know what, this isn't working for me, but God is. That's when you can make a difference in your life. And so we come to realize that we have to go into the sanctuary of God, that place of peace. If you're worried about finances, He can take care of that. If you're wondering if you can have all these things and you're jealous and you have covetous about all those things, come to God and He will bring you that peace so you don't need to worry about those things. Before long, if you had them, you'd probably get rid of them. I need to downsize. I need to do this or that. I could sell that and use that money for Christ some way or somehow. Keep that in mind. Because who's really rich? Who's really blessed? When you come to the when you come to Christ and when that fog of temptation and that fog of sin lifts, you can see clearly. Exodus 25, 8 says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. I this has rocked my world this week. He was talking to Moses telling to go tell Israel. He said, tell Israel to make me a sanctuary that I can dwell with them. He's saying, go build a building and then I will come into that building and they can dwell with me. That's one way of looking at it. The other way is, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Let me make a sanctuary in God, in my relationship with Christ, that he may dwell with me. We want to dwell with Christ. We want to have that interaction with Him. We want to have His love. We want to fill that hole in our life. And, and I, again, I, most of us here sitting here today are Christians, but we can slip. Sometimes we slip only a little bit, and we don't really think we slip. And then we slip just a quarter inch more. We don't really think we slip. See, as long as I don't fall, I'm not slipping. But you know what? You'll go all the way to the end to where you finally fall. Satan wants to get you as far from Christ as he can before he causes you to fall, because then you're out there on your own. And oftentimes we say, you know what? I don't want to get up anymore. Ephesians 6 tells us to shout our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's for me and that's for you. Now, in Minnesota, they sell those ice cleats for shoes. You ever see an L&M fleet? You can put them on. How many got a pair? How many wear them faithfully? Yeah, I, we got a couple pairs somewhere in a box somewhere. Sometimes we have to put on that spiritual cleat. The closer we are with him, the more we understand him, the more we're in love with him, we get to have good footing, no matter what comes in life, whether it's a storm or not. John 16, 33 says, These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ. Through Christ. He's saying... These things will come upon you. Asaph is saying, I almost slipped, I almost fell, but I didn't because I came back to the sanctuary of God. Verse 28 at the very bottom, he says, But it's good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. It is good for me to draw near to God. If you've got to go out and walk on the ice, the Minnesota ice, make sure you're walking towards God. Make sure you're walking towards God. Bow your heads and close your eyes.
Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening, Lord. I thank you for each and every person that's here tonight, Lord. I thank you for Asaph with his honesty. Heavenly Father, I don't believe everyone here has got it all together. I, there ain't one of us that doesn't slip from time to time. But Heavenly Father, help us through the Holy Spirit to say, if I slip, it's no good. I do not want to slip, and I need to get up and fix whatever's causing the slippage. Whether I'm walking on ice, or whatever it might be. Maybe I'm walking on that sand and not the rock. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would strengthen us. Strengthen our bond with you. Strengthen our hunger for you. That we cannot go through the day without saying, I don't feel right unless I spend some time with God. Whether it's through prayer, through reading, through Bible studies. But Heavenly Father, as Asaph said, when I grew near to you. Lord, help us to draw near to you. And Lord, if there's anyone out there that's slipping, anyone out there that has slipped a long ways from God, I ask that you would restore that right now. That as they hear these words, they would say, that is the sign that I needed. I need to go confess to the Lord where I've slipped and ask Him for strength to get back up and confess my sin and move on with Him. Lord, I ask that for the precious name for each and every person that's here and in your name, amen. Amen, amen and amen. There's goodies downstairs. I hope you'll stick around. Uh, there's goodies downstairs.